In this episode, we address the fiduciary duty of a nonprofit board when setting its investment policies and how to think about impact investing in the context of a diversified investment portfolio. I'm delighted that we can take this opportunity to bring you a conversation with Craig Ayers, a senior portfolio manager at Whittier Trust, and Gabe Rissman, president and co-founder of Your Stake. Craig will tell us about the modern portfolio manager's approach to integrating impact investments in a prudent portfolio. And Gabe will give some perspective on metrics and how to think about more than just economic returns when assessing the ESG portfolio. Welcome to the EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferella Braun and Martell. My name is Cynthia Rowland, and I'm a partner at Ferella. I'm a business and tax lawyer with more than 30 years of experience advising clients on nonprofit and charity law. Through this podcast, our lawyers and guests will discuss a range of legal and business issues impacting the nonprofit world because we understand you work hard every day to make your community a better place to live and do business. Many of our programs focus on the basics, and at times we'll do a deep dive into narrow and complicated legal issues. Again, welcome to the EO Radio Show. We're glad you're here. Before the turn of the century, that is, before the year 2000, nearly all charitable institutions with endowments or board-designated reserve funds worked with investment professionals to design a diversified portfolio, mostly of readily marketable securities or investment funds, that focused solely on economic performance. Driven by a deep concern that the investment portfolio generate annual liquidity to fund the organization's operating expenses, and the fear of being criticized if the principal lost value or didn't keep up with inflation, the typical board of directors of a charitable organization would follow the lead of investment professionals in developing investment policies and portfolios that assessed little other than economic risk-reward trade-offs. While there were some organizations that directed their investment advisors to screen out tobacco, fossil fuels, and similar types of investments, By and large, in that era, they would still invest in blue-chip companies that might, in fact, undermine the very purpose of the charitable organization. In around 2002, the Uniform Law Commission, which is an organization focused on creating model uniform laws for all the states, set up a drafting committee to improve the Uniform Management of Institutional Funds Act. That was known as UMIFA. The intent there was to modernize endowment fund rules for fiduciaries of nonprofits. The uniform law that came out of that sausage-grinding drafting process is known as the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act, or UPMIFA as we call it today. UPMIFA's rules for prudent investment decisions were adopted in virtually all the states by 2010. I think Pennsylvania and Puerto Rico are the lone holdouts at this point. If you want details about where UPMIFA has been adopted, see the link in the show notes for more information. So in a nutshell, UPMIFA and the state laws that incorporate it require that in managing and investing an endowment fund, the board first must consider whether there are specific requirements or limitations in the terms of the donor's gift that funded the endowment. If not, if there aren't any donor restrictions, the laws direct that the board consider these nine factors. Number one, the charitable purposes of the institution and the purposes of the institutional fund. Number two, general economic conditions. Three, the possible effect of inflation or deflation. Four, the expected tax consequences, if any, of investment decisions or strategies. Five, the role that each investment or course of action plays within this overall investment portfolio of the fund. Number six, the expected total return from income and appreciation. Seven, other resources of the institution. Eight, the needs of the institution and the fund to make distributions and to preserve capital. And number nine, the assets, special relation or special value, if any, to the charitable purposes of the institution. In addition, the laws provide that the board should not make fund management and investment decisions in isolation and should consider the context of the investment fund's portfolio of investments as a whole and as a part of an overall investment strategy. The investment strategy must be based on risk and return objectives suited to the fund and to the institution. 
the board must diversify the investments unless the board members determine that because of special circumstances, the purposes of the fund are better served without diversification. Subject to all of these standards, the director can invest the endowment in any kind of property or type of investment and still be compliant with UPMIFA. Items 1 and 9 in this list of factors mentioned a few minutes ago are the linchpins for allowing impact investment focus to flourish. The IRS has followed the lead set by UPMIFA and has clarified that it will not penalize private foundations for looking at impact metrics when designing a prudent portfolio. So that's the overview of the legal structure. And with that in mind, let's have a little conversation about how impact investing is done within this context. With that as a background, I'm delighted to introduce Craig and Gabe. Craig Ayers is a Senior Vice President, Senior Portfolio Manager in Whittier Trust's San Francisco office. Craig enjoys working with high net worth families and their philanthropic foundations, investing in portfolios individually tailored for each client's unique circumstances. Craig is also the co-head of the firm's ESG and impact investing efforts. Prior to joining Whittier Trust, Craig was at Alliance Bernstein for 15 years, where he was a senior vice president and portfolio manager of equity and fixed income accounts for mutual fund, insurance, and institutional clients. Prior to that, he was a fixed income analyst and investment banker in New York. Craig earned his bachelor's degree in economics from Colorado College and his MBA from the Wharton School in, at the University of Pennsylvania. He holds the designation of Chartered Financial Analyst and is a member of the CFA Society of San Francisco. Craig is also a current board member of the Walnut Creek Library Foundation. Gabe Rissman is the co-founder and president of Your Stake, which provides explainable ESG analysis and reporting tools to financial advisors. Gabe is a rising star in the field of ESG metrics. He's listed on the wealthmanagement.com 2022 10 to watch list is a board member of the Intentional Endowments Network and the Adesina Social Justice Index Committee. Gabe was named 30 Under 30 in Socially Responsible Investing. Links to his numerous publications are in the show notes. So the three of us, Gabe, Craig, and I, recently recorded a webinar on these topics for the American Bar Association Real Property Trusts and Estates section. Any listeners who are also lawyers and would like to earn continuing education credits for this topic might want to look at the show notes for the link to the ABA website where you can find the webinar. So with that introduction, guys, it's really nice to talk to you again. And I think it'll be fun today to focus our discussion to help foundation and charity executives and their board members. Thanks for joining me, Gabe and Craig. Craig, let's start with an overview. Can you talk about what the acronym ESG actually stands for and what those components are? Yes, certainly. And and first, I just wanted to thank you for having me on the podcast. And Cynthia, you know, from what I've learned over time, your history and laying the foundation to help build ESG and impact has been incredible. I mean, I, I don't think we'd be where we are without what you did with UPMIFA. And then Gabe, you know, your contribution and innovative approach to evolve the value-based investing landscape in a way that's transparent and effective. And by effective, I mean understandable because there is a lot out there and a lot of definitions and, and a lot of other things going with that. So kind of diving into what it is, because as we've learned, it's already, it's complicated. In terms of that acronym, E is really environmental. There was a recent uh, cover of The Economist that said it should just be emissions, which would also fit. It's climate change and pollution. But beyond that, within the environmental, it's about resource depletion and just overall real sustainability with what companies are doing. The S is for social. That comes to the health and safety of the employees, as well as living wage, what kind of pollution they may be putting into different neighborhoods, child labor, and diversity. And then we have G for governance. And really, that's about transparency. It's also about board diversity and structure. Are there checks and balances in there? G has been around for a long time. There's been a lot of companies that have addressed governance. It's still a really important part of what you're considering anytime you're investing in a company. Yeah, that reminds me, and, and thanks for the shout out to the many decades of working in these fields. Um, when I first started practice, there was this saying, if you teach a man, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And that was kind of philanthropy's approach for the first part of my career. And then I wanted to expand that to say, but if you kill all the fish in the sea, you haven't achieved very much. And I think modern ESG and impact investing goes even another step, which is, hey, let's, let's make more fish. Let's make sure there's more out there. And ESG really tries to cover all of that. So, Craig, 
How do you introduce this concept or deal with a nonprofit board that's first starting down this path that hasn't yet really impact investing as part of its portfolio management? How does that conversation start? Well, that is actually the hardest part is getting it started. Once you start into that and you look into it, the first thing that you're going to want to look at as an advisor is what the mission is for that not-for-profit or foundation or donor advisement or whatever that is, even for an individual. You know, one of the great things that your stake has is a survey you can put out to board members as well as family members of a foundation to say, what are you most interested in and what is the mission of the foundation? Once you have that, you can start to integrate that into really best policy is to look at the investment policy statement. And that way, everybody gets on the same page. And with that approach, you can start to align those values with what the mission is and what the values are of that board. And it, it has to be as a board, as a collective, obviously, because you're going to only be able to do that with one set of values in terms of what's moving forward. But you take that collective together and you can start to build the portfolio around that. It can be very enlightening. There's usually a lot of discussion around that. But once you incorporate that into the investment policy statement, then you'll have a document that memorializes that. It not only sets the direction for agreement between the advisor and the foundation, but it also often acts as a lot of protection. And Cynthia, I'd be interested in your view on that in terms of what you've seen and protecting that fiduciary duty that is a lightning rod of people saying, I don't want to do this. This is going to be outside of my fiduciary duty when it's really not. Yeah, I think that's right. The law definitely has evolved over, like I said, since the turn of the century to allow a board to consider impact when making the investments, but it still needs to be prudent. And so it's kind of a, it's an interplay between finding those values and mission metrics that matter to the investment policy and then finding the investments and then going through, and I think this is a topic that you've talked about before, Craig, how the mission objectives enhance the diligence process in choosing the investment strategy. I think they have to work side by side and the board as prudent investors or the investment committee needs to record and memorialize how they came out in their place of, of targeting the portfolio. So it's complicated. So it seems to me it's a lot more complicated than just saying, okay, we need to achieve a 5% return year after year so that we can meet the operating budget and the investment managers are free to go about their business and do that with the least possible risk. It is. The one thing that we see that's a little bit of a misconception when boards approach this is that they're afraid that they're going to take concessionary returns and not be providing for that 5% payout plus any other growth and in, in inflation and other things that may happen along the way. And so really in terms of what ESG and what it does and the metrics that it provides it isn't necessarily something that you're going to have a concessionary return. In fact, I think part of the reason why it's gotten so popular is that it's been used as an investment tool for investing companies that you can trust and that are forward thinking and that are finding talent because there's a lot of younger people as well as older people that want to work for companies that treat their employees well, of course, because you're going to be an employee, but also are treating the environment well and have sustainability built into the DNA of the company, really, that they're going to be around for a long time. And so, you know, the way this used to go is that you would kind of think of this as maybe we're just going to do good and have a concessionary return and it'll be a little bit charitable. That's not really the case. This is an investment tool, just like PE ratios or value versus growth or anything else. This is a nice quality measure and really a win-win. And so my favorite was Ben Franklin said, do well by doing good. Craig, I just want to add something in there real quick. In a majority, the vast majority of the investment policy statements that we see that incorporate ESG, they start with a declarative statement about how ESG is a component of the financial performance analysis that will help them generate enhanced risk-adjusted returns. And that's the framework by which a lot of foundations and uh, nonprofits and endowments are approaching this is using it as a way that they can kind of go on the other side of that argument where it's not concessionary returns. But we believe as an organization that this will be well aligned with where investment returns are in the future. Yeah, I think that's a great start to an investment policy statement. And it also speaks to most foundations are going concerns that are going to be around for more than 10 years. And so sustainability certainly fits well within that. 
I think for the first 10 years, you know, 2000 to 2010, there was a lot of talk about impact investing, but I think people were skeptical that it was a fad, that it wasn't, that ESG couldn't really generate the metrics to support what you're talking about, that it it actually enhances returns. Are we past that now? Are there pockets of investment advisors that still think it's a fad or is this mainstream now? There's certainly pockets of advisors who still think it's a fad. <laughs> and I'll, yes, a, a lot of folks. I, I think about one in three dollars is invested with some sort of sustainability analysis in the equation. Part of the reason why it's gotten this big this fast is because there's demand from clients. They were also facing these issues globally, especially climate change has become more and more obvious over the past few years. That's driven by the fossil fuel use and emissions concerns that go along with that. The other reason that this has become so popular, and I don't think it's a fad, is because it's become part of that sustainable returns and long-term thinking, which a lot of people are moving towards for their portfolios, whether it's for retirement or for college for their kids or anything else like that. That sustainable thinking within a company also leads them, how are they going to innovate and be in the next new thing? What we've run into this year, interestingly, is that there has been a lot of underperformance on a short-term basis by the ESG-oriented and impact-oriented and sustainability type of funds. That makes a lot of sense once you look at what energy has done in terms of fossil fuels, and that's because of the Russian invasion to the Ukraine. Oil prices have skyrocketed. We've all seen that at the gas pump, and energy is one of the few sectors that's up this year, and it's up by more than any other sector that we have. Those fossil fuel type of companies are largely absent or minimal in ESG and sustainability-oriented investments. So what that drives longer term, though, is as that fuel and energy gets very expensive and very political, is more renewables. It just makes people want more renewables. And doesn't that kind of prove that or, or that's a great drilling deep into the whole point of this conversation? The economic returns is just one of the metrics. So let's shift to, to Gabe for a little bit and talk about measuring the other things. Okay, so economic performance may be down the first half of 2022, but how are those other metrics doing for my portfolio this year? So Gabe, can you talk a little bit about the regulatory landscape for ESG, You know where you start this conversation when you're talking to a nonprofit board about your metrics? Sure. Before diving into the regulatory landscape, just in terms of what you said, down market, but what else is going on in the portfolio? We see that all the time. There's actually more confidence and more ability to generate consistent sustainability alignment compared to consistent returns. Because if you're investing in alignment with what's going on and you're keeping on track of that, you're able to monitor portfolio drift. You're able to deliver a portfolio that consistently has less toxic air pollution, for example, or better gender equality. And that's something that you can continue to point to, hey, this is a, an important part of your investment policy statement and an important part of your beliefs and what is important to your organizational mission and something that we're able to continue delivering on. And that keeps investors engaged and it keeps them sticking to their strategy, even when there could be a downturn and some might turn to panic or looking for other strategies. And just a, a quick tying that back to Craig's question a minute ago about how do you protect the board from a challenge for mismanaging the portfolio when their in economic returns are down? I think having your metrics to be able to say in the quarterly or annual report to the board, economics may be down, but the impact metrics are right on track. And so documenting that is a really important part of the fiduciary's record demonstrating that they have been prudent under UPMIFA and the state laws, that they've been prudent in their management of the portfolio. So anyway, sorry for that little set digression, but Gabe, what else do you, do you find critical in, or essential in your conversation with the nonprofits about their metrics or the metrics they want to measure? I think the first thing is very similar to what Craig was saying which is assess people's starting points when it comes to ESG. How much do people understand? What do they know? What do they think they know? What do they know they don't know? And that's both around what the different definitions of ESG are. People have very different views of what this actually means. And it also means how do people feel about and how much do they know about the impact of ESG on financial returns? So step one is getting people on board with that. And then step two is, just like Craig said, translating the organizational mission into an investment policy statement instead of the, the egos of the, the individual board members, although that's an important part to make sure they understand and are aligned and, and are focused on what they care about too. 
It's really about getting to that mission. And then once you have that mission, once you have that starting point, then there are technology tools or it takes research and analysis to be able to map a mission of an organization into investable metrics and metrics that you're able to track and be able to see how you're performing out over time. So that's what we found is the most challenging part for organizations, just like Craig said, it's getting started. It's finding what those metrics are. And then once you have a set of metrics that you want to implement in portfolio construction, then we and others have tools to be able to help deliver reporting that's transparent on those metrics. And the last thing I'll say, a lot of times ESG right now is score-based. And those scores are oftentimes one size fits all. And no nonprofit and foundation is going to have the same priorities and preferences. And a lot of times, if you have a score, it's hard to disassociate what, what the components are and what the underlying factors are that lead to that score. So we think, and it, that's why we built our solution in this way, that providing raw data in explainable and intuitive ways with links back to all the sources and layers of transparency to be able to see exactly where everything's coming from is really important for the board to be able to evaluate and monitor whether they are in compliance with that mission and with that investment policy statement. Can you give us an example? I know we, we didn't really talk about examples before, but is there an example of a, say, a foundation that comes in and says, our one thing that we really want to measure is maybe we're a financial literacy organization and we want to measure our exposure to the financial sector by not involving predatory lending. How would you go about designing measuring system for that kind of a client? Great question. I'll, I'll go in a slightly different direction because I think that I'll try to accomplish a dual goal of expanding the definition of what ESG can mean because it's not a lot of where this comes into foundations and organizations is on the faith side. And that's something that was honestly one of the main driving forces behind the beginning of the development of socially responsible investing and, and ESG. And a lot of times faith-based organizations will say, hey, we are a Catholic diocese or a church or whatever it may be, or an organization aligned in that way. There are particular principles that we need to follow. How can you help us follow that in our portfolio? And oh, by the way, we also have a mission and a program where we work on anti-poverty and hunger. And in addition to all these mandated factors, we also want to focus on nutritional quality and we want to focus on poverty alleviation because that's part of our mission as an organization. It's a lot to consider and then diversify it and provide us a return that's 5% a year or more. You know, that's a piece of cake, right? That's why the challenge exists. It's not easy. People have to work through that. There are different levels of prioritization. And there's also different levels of some factors and some mandates require we will not invest in these companies. And then others are, we will tilt towards particular solutions. And then there are others that are really about the stewardship side of things. So a particular organization can decide that the way that it wants to focus on poverty alleviation or Catholic values or environmental performance is through proxy voting or through shareholder engagement and other stewardship activities. So there's a lot of different strategies to accomplish sustainable investing goals. If there's just a couple of goals, then yeah, you have a lot of flexibility. But when organizations are really asking for a whole laundry list of things, then there's other strategies that you can apply. Or you pick a very concentrated and, and specific portfolio that can give you that flexibility. Well, that's a lot to think about. This is a question I think for both of you. I, I'm curious your thoughts on the greenwashing that we may see in the popular press organizations that I think it's mostly on the investment company, how do you tell whether they're really doing what they're saying they're doing or whether their environmentally sensitive practices are just a marketing tool as opposed to something they're really doing? Any thoughts, either of you on that? That's a tough one. And it is one that comes up a lot. And uh, people are afraid that they're going to invest in a company that later is going to turn out to be a dud, really, and one that they didn't want to be invested in. There's two ways to think about that. Once a company comes out and makes a commitment to be an ESG oriented or have a sustainability report, they're really putting themselves out there. And, and there can be issues with that where uh, the legal side is going to have to get involved and hold their feet to the fire if they're misrepresenting something. And that's the issue with greenwashing is that you can, as a company, go down that road where you're exposing yourself to legal risk as well as reputational risk. So we've seen a couple of companies get in trouble for that. What generally happens is they repair that. They come back and become a better company for it if they can survive through the debacle. 
And so once a company commits to something like this, I'm always excited to see the ESG community hold them to their word. And that's important to go on. And there's a lot of articles that come out about uh, whether a company should be ESG or not. And there's a, a healthy debate coming out of that. So as we see companies go through this and say, okay, we're just going to take advantage of ESG and, and we're going to have greenwashing. Once they dive in that hole, they kind of have to live up to it. So it comes up for us. What we see is um, companies like your stake are really excellent at ferreting out those because as they report, your stake tends to report on things that are more understandable. And you can go into this as, as either a research analyst or just as a common layman, layperson and see, okay, this company had a lot of violations last year. That doesn't really fit with what they're saying in their sustainability report. And it does that a lot of that legwork for you. And it's just a click through. And we have clients who are looking at those things and saying, okay, I read that this company had, was really had a lot of pollution, especially in poorer neighborhoods. And so it's not where people tend to notice, but it's really impacting more disadvantaged folks that don't have a way of, of fighting this. You know, is that true? And that's actually right within the documentation that you can go through and the flags that pop up. So those flags don't care what they say in the sustainability report. They're really about what's being said in terms of violations and other things. Craig, very flattering. I really appreciate that. And that's exactly what we're working towards is trying to combat the greenwashing. I'd also love to address this from the SEC perspective. The SEC issued a risk alert in April 2021, essentially seeing that a lot of mutual funds and ETFs have recently labeled themselves as being ESG focused. And one, don't always have ESG processes to back that up. Two, sometimes make claims that they're not following. Three, don't document what ESG processes they're following. And four, sometimes they're just very, very light touch. And it's hard for investors to differentiate between a light touch ESG strategy and a very deep integration. So a lot of times that leads to investors being confused why their Save the Planet ESG fund looks exactly the same as the benchmark index. That's something that the SEC has now proposed rules to try to overcome a lot of these challenges. In particular, they're requiring or proposing to require funds to classify themselves as either integration funds, ESG focused funds, or ESG impact funds. And integration funds consider one or more ESG factors uh, along with non-ESG factors in their investment decision making process. ESG focused funds focus on one or more ESG factors as the significant or main considerations in selecting investments or their engagement strategy. And then impact funds are a subset of funds that seek to achieve a specific ESG impact. And the SEC's approach is to require funds to classify into these systems, then disclose data to be able to back up their classification. And the SEC is not taking a very prescriptive approach saying this is what ESG means and not that. ESG means gender equality and human rights, and it doesn't mean guns and whatever else. It's not saying that. It's saying you define your process. You need to provide these disclosures to prove it. We're just going to make sure you're following that process. So I think that is a really great way to help combat greenwashing because greenwashing comes, again, from mislabeling, misleading marketing. So the SEC standard disclosures will really help. And misalignment of expectations. So for example, I know a lot of people that and organizations that really focus on climate and they get into an ESG fund and they see companies that they're surprised to see that don't align with their view of what ESG means. But maybe that fund was focused on broad-based risk or the governance side of things or human rights or gender equality. And therefore, it can still be a fund that is focused on values and that's focused on these ESG issues but it's not necessarily aligned. And having these disclosures around what exactly your strategy is will allow investors to invest in funds that don't just have a generic ESG label, but actually fits with what their definition is and what they're looking for when they're looking for an ESG product. Cynthia, in that context, have you seen folks in foundations look at how they're approaching this and defining Instead of having a manager define what they're doing in terms of ESG and what type of ESG they're having, they do it themselves. 
and do individual securities more often? And is there, Gabe, I was wondering, kind of the second part of that is, is there more personalization? I'm not always involved in the actual development of the investment policies. I know in the early part of my career, the foundations were, they'd state what their values were with screens. And as they've developed more in a more sophisticated ESG focus, that conversation is primarily with the investment advisors. And the biggest issue at this point when I see it is concern about how to measure, how to evaluate the metrics of whether the actual impact is there. And that's the same on the investment side as it is on their on their grant making side. It's much more with the change in MIFA and the prudent standard to make it clear that the board can look at the other factors then I'm kind of done, you know, work with your investment advisor, develop your policy statement and develop some way of measuring it with your managers. And you're going to be fine from a prudent investor standard. But it's really hard it could, because these aren't there aren't legal bright lines about some things there are like child labor. That's a pretty bright line. But it's not usually a legal issue. It's much more on the side of how do we know that our fund advisors or the investment funds are actually what they say they are, which goes to to Gabe's point. The regulatory bodies are now starting to step up. I mean, it's been going on for a while, but it's becoming a stronger and stronger piece of the field that there are regulators looking at it and that if a a fund or investment manager is mislabeling their product, it's going to be noticed. So as we wrap up our conversation today, I want to ask you one more closing thought on the most common misconception for your clients as they think about stepping into this field. Is there something that comes up all the time that, that you wish people just knew? Don't let this stop you from impact investing. This misconception is needs to be laid to rest. Kind of a myth versus fact question. Any thoughts on that? Do you have a common misconception you want to set aside at this point? unfortunately contributed to this during the podcast, but I think the common misconception is around the definition of ESG. My own view is ESG, if used correctly, which I did not do today, is the environmental, social, and governance factors that are material to financial performance with companies. And if that was all the definition of ESG meant, it would be a much less complex world because we would all be talking about the same thing. Whereas a lot of times now people mean use ESG as a more umbrella term to talk about general values-based investing, to talk about a whole bunch of different strategies, to talk about impact investing, stewardship, everything. And I think being more precise about the language and the terms makes a lot of sense and can clear up a lot of misconceptions. We generally like to use values-aligned investing uh, as separate from ESG investing, where ESG investing is a particular thesis about the risk return factors and values-aligned investing is asking the question, really, what do you care about? What is your organizational mission and what matters there? And to to Craig's earlier question about personalization, I think you're doing that really, really well as a firm and providing individual securities can really help on both of those definitions. And we're seeing a trend move in that direction. But that misconception of what does ESG actually mean is the biggest one. And it's leading to a lot of pushback where people are, I believe, pushing back against a straw man. Yeah, maybe we should have labeled this up front as values-based investing versus ESG. <laughs> what is the difference? You said that really beautifully, Gabe. I really appreciate that. Craig, any any closing thoughts on misconceptions? I think the other one that we get is it, it has to do with difference, but it's am I making a difference? It, does, does my vote really count if I invest this way? And I always think of this as exactly that, a vote. If you're voting at the polls and you believe that you're voting for a candidate or for a cause or for a tax or anything else or against a tax, then you're probably making some sort of difference. And it is important to vote. And that the evidence against saying it, it's not making a difference for some reason is becoming more and more apparent as we see all of these companies come out with sustainability reports where they're being held more and more to provide data that we can analyze about how much they're impacting negatively or positively in the world and what a difference that's making. So for the investors that have already done it, thank you. And, and you have made a difference. And for those that would like to, the evidence is out there that it really does. This has been great, you guys. I so appreciate you sharing your thoughts. And and I think we wrap this up in a really, really positive approach. And I hope the listeners have learned something today. And I personally, I certainly have. So that's it for today. I'm Cynthia Rowland, and you've been listening to EO Radio Show, your nonprofit legal resource, brought to you by the Exempt Organizations Group at Ferrella Braun and Martell. If you have suggestions for topics you would like for us to discuss, please email us at eoradioshow at fbm.com. That's eoradioshow at fbm.com. 
Thank you for joining us today. Until next time, make a difference. Make a difference.